Sylvie Darcy leads what I would call a spotless life. She doesn't lead a life that would presage such an extreme act of violence. How did this vehicle catch fire? Is it a simple accident? Maybe an electrical fault? Or was it set on fire deliberately? The guy who's accused of having committed the murder has a bullet in his back, and there's no third party. There's no sign of abuse, there's no weapon, there's no proof, there's only personal... Sunday, February the 26th, 2012, it's 11.06 p.m. when the operations center of the Evelyn police station in the Paris region receives an emergency call. At the end of the line, François Darcy, 46, is distraught and in tears. He and his wife Sylvie have just been attacked. He's in somewhat of a panic. He's not being very clear. The police question him for more information so that they can help him, and he says that he's been hit, that he's been shot, that his car is on fire, and that he believes his wife is inside it. The man still manages to communicate his exact position, the parking lot of Port Royal Abbey in the forest of Saint Lambert des Bois. The police rush to the scene. After making their way with some difficulty down a 400-meter forest track, which is plunged in darkness, they discover an apocalyptic scene. The vehicle the investigators find on the scene is a total inferno. It's engulfed in flames. They can't get anywhere near it, and they can't tell if there's anyone inside. 20 meters from the car, François Darcy is found lying on the ground, curled up in a ball. Although he can't move, he manages to explain the circumstances of the tragedy to the police. He briefly explains that he'd had to stop because he needed to urinate. He decided to enter this wooded area to stop and to walk a little bit away from the vehicle to relieve himself. It was then that he felt a pain in his shoulder and saw the attackers set fire to his vehicle. He tells them that he has pain in his shoulder, that he has pain in his back, that he's been shot. At that moment, it's observed that there is indeed a bullet hole in his back. His jacket has a hole in it. It's at this time that he'll be given first aid in the emergency vehicle, which is on site. As required in the event of gunshot wounds, samples are taken from François Darcy's hands using a sample stub. They might become valuable pieces of evidence. At 2.50 a.m., the firefighters called to the scene finally managed to get the fire in the car under control. On the passenger seat, the police discover the charred remains of a human body, which are immediately removed and transferred to the mortuary in Gauche. Given the seriousness of the crime, the Versailles Criminal Investigation Squad is called in to intervene and take charge of the investigation. At dawn, the area is taped off to secure the crime scene and collect as many clues as possible. The first findings are carried out by technicians from the IRCGN, the National Forensic Science Laboratory. The task at the crime scene is very difficult. The rescue teams have made a lot of changes to the area of the parking lot we're in. Indeed, the experts have to work on ground soaked by the firefighters while putting out the fire and where the rescue teams have left a large number of tire tracks and footprints. It's under these particularly complicated conditions that the investigation begins. We initiate a thorough search, allowing several investigators and several technicians to comb the whole area in search of potential traces and clues, objects that may have been left by the perpetrator or perpetrators of this attack. No less than 85 soldiers take part in the operation. The main objective is to find a key piece of evidence in this assault case, namely the weapon with which François Darcy was wounded. But the search produces nothing. They even called in a dog handler, specializing in the search for weapons and ammunition that the perpetrator or perpetrators could have left behind. However, other clues are found near the vehicle, 
a stick, which seems to have been recently cut, a used tissue, as well as a condom wrapper. These are immediately sealed in evidence bags and sent to the laboratory for analysis. The experts then turn their attention to the frame of the burnt vehicle, and very soon, they make a surprising discovery. In the front passenger seat, we found a bag, most of which had not been burned. In it, we find documents suggesting that it belongs to Mrs. Darcy. Inside the bag, the investigators find several objects in the name of Sylvie Darcy, a social security card, a credit card, and a driver's license. An arson investigator is also sent to the scene. He immediately notices that the driver's side door is detached from the frame of the car and lying on the ground. For him, this is proof that the door was open when the fire broke out. It remains to be seen why. The expert then collects samples of ash, ash which could prove to be a valuable clue because its analysis will make it possible to detect whether or not they contain a fire accelerator. In particular, we're trying to find out how this vehicle caught fire. Was it a simple accident, maybe an electrical fault, or was it set on fire on purpose? While they wait for the results of the analysis, the investigators are having a hard time deciding how the attack happened. Did the Darcy's end up in the wrong place at the wrong time? Either we have some lone person in the forest who was in the process of doing something illegal and who didn't want to be seen, who made the ultimate decision to harm Mr. and Mrs. Darcy, or we have a crime that was fully prepared and totally premeditated. An autopsy is immediately performed on the charred corpse discovered in the vehicle. First of all, the medical examiner discovers a fragment from a pair of panties which seem to be soaked in an oily substance. The evidence is immediately sealed in a bag and sent to the lab for analysis. The medical examiner then takes a blood sample. Quickly analyzed, it makes it possible to formally identify the victim using her DNA. It is indeed Sylvie Darcy. Although the body has been badly damaged by the fire, the expert notices several fractures in the skull. However, according to him, they may have been caused by gunshots. The priority is therefore to search for the presence of projectiles in the victim's head. The first step will be a radiology and imaging assessment. In this case, there are no foreign bodies. Nothing resembling bullets will be found. If Sylvie Darcy was not shot like her husband, what could have caused these head injuries? The effects of fire can cause significant damage, and also what are called false fractures will end up with a skull that shows lesions that may be related to the fire. The autopsy continues with the internal examination of the body to try, in particular, to determine the causes of death. We'll try to find out if the person has inhaled smoke, if there is smoke in the bronchi, in the respiratory tract, which indicates that they were alive at the time of the fire. But an examination of the trachea and lungs reveal no trace of smoke. Sylvie Darcy was therefore already dead when the fire started. So what caused her death? There are no chest injuries. There are no heart or lung injuries, and the person wasn't poisoned by the smoke from the fire. There's no abdominal lesion. And so, at the end of the autopsy, the cause of Sylvie Darcy's death becomes an additional mystery for the investigators. The priority now is to discover the origin of the fire that ravaged the Darcy's vehicle. It's now that the police receive the analysis of the ashes taken from inside the car and the fragment of Sylvie Darcy's underwear. These clues provide an important piece of information. A liquid is found, which will be identified as vegetable oil, which is present in fairly large quantities. Vegetable oil is an oil that can be used as a fire accelerant. 
The report is conclusive. The presence of this highly flammable substance proves that the fire in the car was not only intentional, but also carefully prepared by its perpetrator. Ordinary mortals will say, I'm going to get some gas. The problem with products such as gasoline and denatured alcohol is that they're volatile and there will be gases shut inside the car. There's the risk of an explosion, the rapid ignition of all these gases. While oil is very different, oil will ignite gradually. It will present much less of a risk for the arsonist. Another clue reinforces the arson scenario. The door on the driver's side, which was found on the ground, was open when the fire broke out. The fact that the driver's door was open meant that there was a flow of air bringing in a large supply of oxygen, which allowed the fire to develop quickly and in good conditions. If you start a fire inside a vehicle and close all the doors and windows, it's very likely that the vehicle will not burn completely. The interior will be damaged, but the fire won't have enough oxygen to develop. For the investigators, all these clues seem to demonstrate real proficiency on the part of the arsonist. This leads me to thinking that this is someone who knows about fire, who is interested in fire, and knows how to make a clean blaze without the risk of injuring himself and for it to be efficient. It remains to be seen what the reasons are for this meticulously prepared fire. Was the perpetrator trying to remove compromising clues? The experts therefore sift through the remains of the burned out car. Sifting consists of precisely determining the contents of the vehicle and going into it in detail in order to extract the slightest piece of evidence present in this vehicle. And very soon, the sifting process bears fruit. Underneath the spare wheel, we discover some 222 caliber Remington ammunition, both used and unused. In all, 14 bullets of this caliber are taken away in evidence bags. At the end of these analyses, the mystery has deepened around the murder of Sylvie Darcy. And for the investigators, any scenario is now possible. Not only did they not give Sylvie Darcy a chance, but they're trying to destroy any evidence. That's something that can be looked into. He's the killer. He doesn't want the murder to be traced back to him. But he's put considerable effort into it. It's the middle of the night in a forest car park. It's a pretty spectacular way of doing it. Why go that far? To the point of burning the vehicle? Burning the body inside it? Any objects inside it? We don't immediately understand this desire to destroy Mrs. Darcy's body to such an extent. Hence the interest in looking into Mr. and Mrs. Darcy, their family, and their personal and financial background in order to establish any possible desire for revenge against Mrs. Darcy. The investigator's priority is now to examine the lives and personalities of the Darcy's, starting with Sylvie. The initial inquiries point to a totally normal lifestyle for this 48-year-old woman, a mother of two children and an executive in a large company. It comes out that she is a model employee who doesn't make a fuss, who earns a very good living, who is the ideal mother with no problems. She's described as a jovial woman who likes going out, cultural activities, shopping. Sylvie Darcy leads what I'd call a spotless life. She works. She and Francois look after their relationship. She doesn't lead the kind of life that would herald such an outburst of violence. Sylvie and Francois Darcy had met 10 years previously on an online dating site. She was divorced with no children, while he, four years her junior, lived as a confirmed bachelor in front of his computer. Francois Darcy is a computer scientist. He designs programs, management software. I think he's well known. Much more than just a job, his passion had, for a long time, stood between this computer genius and a fulfilling love life. 
For Francois Darcy's mother, the arrival of Sylvie in her son's life in November 2001 was therefore a real blessing. He said to me, I've met a girl. If you'd like, I love her very much. Would you agree to come and have lunch with us? I said that I'd go with them, and so afterwards, Francois asked me, what do you think of her? I said, she seems very nice to me, very reasonable, very nice. For her part, Sylvie seems to have found a partner with whom to share her life. She was looking to start a family, and she found Francois Darcy. They got together very quickly, they got married very quickly, they had their first child quite quickly, and then a second one. After 10 years of marriage, the Darcy's are an ordinary couple, and nothing in the investigation reveals any sign of a lover or mistress. The investigators have no evidence to support the theory of personal revenge against Sylvie Darcy. Two days after the crime, the investigators don't have a single lead. They are now counting on Francois Darcy's statement. Having been shot, his survival is something of a miracle, as the bullet the surgeons removed was lodged just a few centimeters from his heart. Medically, he is out of danger, but the investigators still fear for his life. He's placed in a room with a police officer to protect him, because as he's been the victim of a shooting, his assailants could try to finish him off. The police want to gather as many details as possible about the hours preceding the attack. Still in shock, the survivor tells them that the tragedy occurred at the end of a romantic weekend. It was a weekend to celebrate Sylvie and Francois Darcy's 10th wedding anniversary. They'd been organizing it since January. He'd booked a hotel in the town of Mion la chapelle a few kilometers from their home. I don't think it's even 10 kilometers away. But the scenery is radically different. It's a very rural setting. Francois Darcy had left nothing to chance for this very special occasion. Mr. Darcy describes his weekend in detail, with all the activities he'd planned. They go to a restaurant on Friday evening in Versailles, then they go to the hotel. On Saturday, they spend an idyllic day in the area around the hotel, with a pre-booked massage in the afternoon. The next day, he deliberately misses breakfast and brings his wife flowers. To give you an example of how well the weekend was going, his wife speaks with her mother and says, I'm having a wonderful weekend, etc. She'll be happy with this weekend. The husband describes this romantic weekend almost minute by minute with a wealth of details, one of which holds the investigator's attention. When they look into his movements, Francois Darcy tells them that he goes off by himself on the Sunday afternoon while his wife was watching rugby on TV, as he's not interested in it. He explains of his own accord that he went home to reload some bullets. And indeed, the computer scientist has recently discovered a new passion, recreational shooting. He has joined a shooting club, but there are many people who enjoy recreational shooting. We will find out that, like most hunters and recreational shooters, he makes his own ammunition. The police then question him about the 222 mm caliber bullets found in the trunk of the car. Francois Darcy confirms that they are indeed his. He carries on by stating that he returned to the hotel around 6 p.m., where he then spent the evening with his wife. They have dinner in a Japanese restaurant. They spend a bit of time there, and around 9 p.m., they leave the restaurant and head back towards the hotel. Reaching a crossroads, while they are five minutes away from their hotel, Mr. Darcy has an urgent need for the bathroom. Francois Darcy turns right onto a dirt road. It's a rather bumpy dirt road and not at all lit, of course. It's dark, it's about 9.30 p.m. And they go to the parking lot. Francois Darcy gets out, leaving his door open. He approaches the edge of the parking lot to urinate, and at that moment, he feels a sharp pain in his left shoulder. Francois Darcy explains that he then collapsed because of the pain. 
Dazzled by the headlights of his vehicle, he was unable to see the face of the attacker who was standing near the car about 20 meters away. He doesn't describe any conversation with the possible attackers. He doesn't describe any violence against his wife. He just says, I was attacked and I threw myself to the ground to protect myself. It's at this moment that François Dalcy loses consciousness. He wakes up after a while and he sees the car burning. And it is then that he calls the emergency services. At the end of this interrogation, the investigators are still unclear about what kind of ambush the Darcy's could have fallen into. However, they hope that the bullet extracted from François Darcy's chest will be the clue that puts them on the trail of the murderer. On February the 29th, 2012, three days after the incident, the bullet that injured François Dalcy is examined by a ballistics expert. When the bullet extracted from François Dalcy's wound is presented to my colleague, he immediately identifies it as a 222 Remington bullet, which is a very powerful, very fast caliber used either for recreational shooting, target shooting, or for hunting. This ammunition, which is widely used in recreational shooting, doesn't provide any interesting information in and of itself or anything that could make it a serious piece of evidence. On the other hand, the state of the bullet arouses the expert's curiosity. Although this bullet had been shot by a gun, it wasn't deformed at all. For the ballistics expert, the fact that the bullet is intact is very surprising. Any 222 projectile will be deformed on impact, considering its speed. Here we have a shot that was apparently fired from less than 20 meters. So the bullet has all its speed, all its power, and should be seriously deformed. But it isn't at all. But another aspect intrigues the expert, given that this ammunition is known for its powers of penetration. A 222 bullet can pass through two or three people in a row without any problem. Whereas here, we have a bullet that travels a distance of about 20 centimeters, maybe a little less, I don't know. The ballistics experts told us very clearly that, normally, his shoulder would have been torn off if the shot had been fired with this type of ammunition in a normal context. A bullet found intact and with very low force on impact, for the ballistics expert, there is only one explanation. The ammunition had been loaded with very little powder. Faced with these conclusions, the investigators start wondering, why did the attacker shoot François Darcy with such a reduced capacity bullet? While the investigators lose themselves in conjecture, on March the 1st, 2012, four days after the crime, François Dalcy asks to be interviewed again. He then explains that for the past few months, he's been the victim of a series of malicious acts, the last of which took place barely three days before the fatal attack. That day, after his session at the shooting range, he discovers that his car has been broken into. He notices signs of a break-in on his trunk. Opening the tailgate, he discovers that two weapons, two carbines, one 22 caliber long rifle, and a second 222 caliber Remington. These weapons have been stolen, as well as some ammunition. François Darcy specifies that he immediately declared the theft of his two rifles. But that's not all, because a month earlier, he had already been the victim of another theft from his car, this time on his return from a business trip. On January the 26th, 2012, François left some computer equipment in the trunk worth around 10,000 euros. He stopped on the highway on his way home to have a coffee and stretch his legs a bit. And when he got back to the car, the lock had been cut out and all the computer equipment was gone. It was the only car in the parking lot that had been broken into. But for François Darcy, the theft of his computer hard drive was no accident. It was linked to a professional dispute, which had been poisoning his life for almost three years. François Darcy is in a dispute with a company. 
that uses his software, his accounting software. He accuses this company of having stolen his algorithm, his software. His damages amount to several hundred thousand euros. And when you add in interest and compensation, it's more than one million euros. The IT specialist is convinced that since then, he has been the victim of reprisals from this former client. He explains to the investigators that this intimidation began at the end of 2009, in other words, just after the start of the proceedings, and the aim of his opponent being to make him withdraw his complaint. But Francois Darcy has refused to be intimidated. And as luck would have it, the tragedy that has claimed the life of his wife has taken place barely a month before the date of the trial. Inquiries are immediately made about this company. Its director is brought in and is questioned at length by the police. For us, this lead is interesting. It has to be followed. We make some inquiries. The company in question, with which Mr. Darcy is in dispute, fully recognizes the dispute and declares that, in any case, this dispute has already been clearly identified and that the potential damages have already been established. There is no reason for them to want to physically hurt Mr. and Mrs. Darcy. The investigators are convinced that this firm has no connection with the case and the lead pointing to a settlement of professional scores is definitively ruled out. Since the start of their investigation, the police have been wondering how the Dalsi's attacker, or attackers, could have been in this parking lot when the couple hadn't planned to go there. Was their car followed? The investigators then decide to search for any CCTV cameras that may have filmed the couple during their weekend. Cameras installed in the hotel, restaurants and car parks, remote surveillance cameras in the streets the Darcy's walk down. Nothing is left to chance, but no suspicious figures or vehicles are spotted. On the other hand, by viewing all these videos, the investigators piece together Francois Darcy's movements, which are intriguing, to say the least. They will see that Francois Darcy leaves the hotel on Saturday morning on his own and returns an hour and a half later carrying a fairly long black bag. However, he has always claimed that on that Saturday morning he stayed at the hotel with his wife. Why has Francois Darcy lied? Especially since, by continuing to watch the hotel's video surveillance tapes, the investigators discover another inconsistency. On Sunday afternoon also, he tells us that he went home to reload some ammunition because he's a firearms enthusiast. But the hotel video, which is very informative, shows that Mr. and Mrs. Darcy's vehicle didn't move and that the couple themselves didn't leave the hotel that afternoon. But why did Francois Darcy invent this story about reloading bullets? To see things more clearly, the investigators first try to find out where the husband went to that Saturday morning. And it's a vital clue, his telephone, which will provide the answer. His call data records show that he returned to his home and that, in addition, his phone used his home Wi-Fi that morning. The call data analysis provides another surprising piece of information. The investigators discover that on the evening of the tragedy, Francois Darcy took an hour and seven minutes to call for help. The call records show that Mr. Darcy arrived in the area near the car park at 9.59 p.m. What we can understand is that he only calls for help at 11.06 p.m. Why does this concern us? Quite simply, because Mr. Darcy explains that he arrived on the scene, he got out of his vehicle very quickly, urinated, and was attacked immediately. We can't understand why he waited 67 minutes before calling for help, if he says he was attacked immediately. For the police, the case takes a completely different turn. Francois Darcy, who was previously a victim of the attack, is now the number one suspect. First of all, the inconsistency between the choice of going to urinate at this place when it's only five minutes to the hotel, the autopsy, which shows that Mrs. Darcy died before the fire, the bullet found in his body, which is abnormally deformed, and which also corresponds to the ammunition he usually uses. 
qu'il aurait the weapons that he was unfortunate enough to have had stolen a few days previously all of these elements plus the lies in his story demonstrate to a considerable extent that mr darcy certainly has a connection with what happened even if we don't know exactly how it happened and who did it. Faced with this accumulation of corroborative evidence, on March the 4th, 2012, six days after the events, François Dalcy is placed in police custody. From the start of his interrogation, François Dalcy is confronted with the inconsistencies in his movements revealed by the CCTV cameras. Faced with these images, François Darcy explains that he gave his first statement when he was in a state of shock, that he was high on drugs, and that he simply confused Saturday and Sunday. The investigators find it very hard to believe that François Darcy was able to confuse his activities on Saturday and Sunday. What's more, he says nothing about the large black bag he was carrying when he returned to the hotel. He cannot explain the presence of this bag, and in any case, he very soon invokes his right to remain silent, so we won't get anything more out of him. Faced with his silence, the interrogation of François Darcy is at an impasse. But at the same time, the ballistics expert submits his report on the search for gunshot residue on the suspect's hands. The evidence was collected right after the attack, and the results are clear. The sample stubs reveal the presence of gunshot residues on Mr. Darcy's hands. The ballistics expert will affirm that these residues are certainly the result of Mr. Darcy being in the proximity of a shot being fired within the five hours before the sample was taken, either in his presence or carried out by himself with a firearm. For the expert, it's this second hypothesis which is the most credible because the concentration of gunfire residue found on François Dalcy's hands is much too high for a person who has been the target of a gunshot. François Dalcy estimates that there was a distance of 15 to 20 meters between him and the shooter when he was wounded. At such a distance, to my knowledge, it's absolutely impossible for there to be any gunshot residue deposit unless it's carried by the wind. If the wind is favorable, going in one direction from the shooter to the victim, it can be assumed quite anecdotally that the wind will carry some residue from the shots. But this is an extremely low concentration. There is no direct projection at such a distance. For the police, these results seem to show that François Dalcy used a firearm himself on the evening of the crime. But if so, who did he shoot? His wife? or even himself, shooting himself in the shoulder. This is the first unusual aspect of this case, that the guy who is accused of having committed the crime has a bullet in his back, and that there is no third party. So he shot himself in the back. Now, anything is possible. The investigators start to wonder, when François Dalcy said he'd gone home on the Sunday afternoon to prepare his ammunition a few hours before the attack, was this a ploy intended to anticipate their question about the presence of powder on his hands? We assume that he was seeking to justify the possible presence of gunshot residue on his hands. For us, he could have explained the reason for it by saying, it is normal that you found residue on my hands, because in the afternoon, I handled ammunition at my home, except that he couldn't have done that, because the video clearly showed that he didn't leave the hotel. More than ever, the investigators are certain that the attack on the Dalsies is nothing but a devious setup. While François Dalcy's custody is extended by 24 hours, the investigators decide to search his home. And when they enter the apartment, they are amazed. We're confronted with a huge mess in the apartment, with objects scattered all over the floor and on the furniture. They find an extremely chaotic apartment with things everywhere, groceries in the bathtub, clothes under and on top of the dining table, an ironing board in the hallway. It's a total mess. Nothing has been tidied away. We wonder if he's been burgled. 
But Francois Darcy explains that this is not the case. The couple and their two children have always lived in these shambles. The mess complicates the search of the premises, but the investigators still manage to find some evidence. We find parts of weapons, pieces of gun barrel that have been cut, most certainly with a grinder, which is also found at his home. The police also find ammunition of different calibers, including the famous 222 mm one with which Francois Darcy was hit. He has also set up a professional workshop in which to reload these bullets. The investigators take away different types of powder, different types of cases, a reloading press, extremely technical tools of the kind used by a gunsmith or hunter or marksman. I don't even have such high quality equipment myself. For those close to Francois Darcy, this paraphernalia is explained by the recreational shooter's perfectionism. Everything Francois does, he does with a passion, whether it's IT, whether it's whatever it is, he does it thoroughly. He doesn't know how to do things by halves. He develops an interest in weapons a year and a half before the event. So from the end of 2009, he becomes passionate about them. I think that in guns, he finds the highly technical and specialized element that he loves in computers. Because of that, he doesn't just start shooting with an average rifle to relax. He buys a lot of guns, really expensive things, and he takes them apart, and then he takes them apart again. He learns to make his own bullets. He cuts down the stock, he puts things together. He really does improbable things with his weapons, although he's a beginner in the field. Despite everything, an element discovered in the workshop surprises the investigators. What also worries us is that we find gelatin. Even seasoned shooters don't necessarily have this type of gelatin. It's a very specialist product, which you don't find everywhere. Gelatin allows certain shooters to carry out tests, which allow them to get an idea of how far a bullet will sink into the gelatin to assess the depth to which the ammunition will penetrate a body whether human or animal. However, Francois Darcy, an amateur shooter, only fires at targets. But the investigators have an explanation for the presence of this gelatin at his home. Darcy used the product to prepare his scenario, namely pretending to be the victim of an attack by shooting himself in the shoulder without causing himself too much bodily harm. But then again, the suspect has an explanation. Francois Darcy explained that he'd bought the gelatin on a whim, but that he hadn't even used it. Which is true, the package is unopened. It was another compulsive purchase made by Francois Darcy, who wanted to have everything in order to indulge in his passion. While continuing their search, the investigators discover another clue. In Sylvie Darcy's belongings, they find a planner, a kind of journal in which she confided the problems she'd been having in her marriage since the end of 2011, two months before her death. She complains about Francois Darcy's attitude, that he puts the music on full blast, that he has no consideration for her and the children, that he unplugged the TV decoder so that she couldn't watch a film, the little frustrations of daily life that really annoyed her. She also explains that she's going to contact a lawyer to ask for a separation. Did Francois Darcy refuse to let his wife leave him? With this new clue, the investigators may have a motive. The investigation into the mysterious attack on the Dalsies is moving increasingly towards the involvement of the husband. But why would he have wanted to get rid of his wife? Interviews of those around them confirm that Francois and Sylvie Dalsy were on the verge of breaking up. Sylvie's friends and family describe a toxic atmosphere between the Darcy's, who obviously no longer loved one another very much. And Sylvie Darcy confided in several of her friends that she was fed up with living with Francois Darcy and that she would not end her days with him. 
The investigators then discovered that these tensions in the couple were linked to the problems Francois Dalcy was having with his computer company. An examination of the couple's assets shows that Sylvie Darcy was earning much more than her husband, around 3,800 euros per month against his income, which varied between 1,000 and 1,500 a month while he was running his own company and going through a rough time. But surprisingly, Francois Dalcy's precarious situation didn't seem to prevent him from living a full life. Francois Darcy tends to show off. He's a very bad manager and he has absolutely no idea how to manage his money. On the other hand, as soon as he has a little at his disposal, and even if it's not his, he'll make very, very large purchases and buy the most expensive, the most beautiful things, which he then shows off to his friends. He has a rather flashy relationship with money. Mr. Darcy often uses his wife's credit card, without her knowledge, to make large purchases of items such as firearms, which cost large amounts, which she's also exasperated by. And a lot of times she finds this out later, because he doesn't even tell her what he's buying. Extravagant behavior that, it would seem, Sylvie Darcy could no longer tolerate. In their daily life, Mrs. Darcy was left to run the house and to bring in enough to keep the family going. She looked after the children. He didn't look after them much. He was only there to spend money all the time. I think that, in the end, Mrs. Darcy couldn't take any more. Had Sylvie Darcy decided to stop supporting her husband financially, which was so intolerable to him that he wanted to get rid of her? The investigators then used some extremely valuable evidence, the couple's bank statements, because by going through them, they discovered that the reality is not so simple. We also know that Sylvie Darcy was a big spender. She did a lot of shopping, and she didn't pay too much attention to how much she spent. Neither of them were good with their money. They'd ended up with a number of consumer debts and loans that had been taken out by both of them. More by Sylvie than by Francois, in fact. For Francois Darcy's attorney, the financial motive is inadmissible. He even refutes the scenario according to which the Darcy's were on the verge of breaking up. It's hypothesized that the relationship wasn't working, that there was a very serious disagreement over the management of their finances. So why was this weekend taking place? If they're about to separate, they're not going to celebrate their wedding anniversary, the anniversary of their meeting. They're not going to spend money going to the Chevreuse Valley and give each other presents, etc. It's not consistent. There are a lot of people who mismanage their budgets, but that doesn't mean they divorce and separate. But looking through the most recent purchases made by Francois Darcy, the investigators come across a new clue which could prove conclusive as to his guilt. A month before, he bought a large coverall to protect himself from all sorts of things, to avoid any kinds of projections, any transfer of various products. The investigators are convinced that Francois Darcy could have used this coverall to protect himself from being splashed by combustible products, in particular the vegetable oil used to set fire to his car. But it's impossible to confirm this thesis because the coverall cannot be found. Francois Darcy maintains that it is still in its packaging at his home and that if they haven't found it, it's because they haven't looked properly. But the police are convinced that Francois Darcy has been careful to get rid of this compromising piece of evidence. On the other hand, they still don't understand what could have driven their suspects to commit such a devious crime. Still looking for a motive that could have driven Francois Dalcy to kill his wife, the investigators go through the couple's financial assets. Then they discover a final clue, an insurance policy taken out by Sylvie Dalcy through her work and for the benefit of her family. Mrs. Darcy has a life insurance policy provided by her employer, which means that her children and her husband will receive a sum of money if ever the slightest thing happens to her. 
The policy guarantees that in the event of Sylvie Dalcy's death, a sum of 222,000 euros will be paid to her husband. But when questioned on this subject, François Darcy declares he was totally unaware of this policy, while his relatives unanimously reject the theory of a financially motivated crime. The financial lead seems to be going nowhere. But still convinced of François Darcy's guilt, the investigators now believe that the motive is to be found on the side of the suspect's personality. Mr. Darcy is a complex character, a real megalomaniac who very much likes to be looked at and to be admired. We think that Mrs. Darcy's desire for a separation from him is something that he wouldn't have accepted. And it's for this reason that he might have put together a scheme to end their relationship. But in his own way, and in such a way that he would still be the victim, and so gain something from these events. On March the 6th, 2012, eight days after the events, François Dalcy is indicted for intentional homicide and imprisoned. One of the very first clues in this case seems to incriminate François Dalcy, but the presence of gunshot residue on his hands is the only concrete proof of this possible guilt. This evidence will be questioned by his attorneys. As it's necessary to refute this point, which is very negative for them, they will pay out of their own pocket for a second analysis, and this analysis will totally massacre the first one. According to the first report, the powder residue on François Dalcy's hands proved that he had used a firearm in the five hours preceding the tragedy. But for Thierry Lozeu, a former officer in charge of the counter-investigation, this interpretation doesn't hold water. With gunshot residue, there either is or there isn't a positive result on an individual's hand. That's the first thing. The second thing is you can't date a shot. You can't put a date on it. It can't be done. You can't say he touched a weapon two hours, three hours ago, a day ago. It's not possible. What's more, François Dalcy is a regular recreational shooter. Through handling firearms and ammunition, he's likely to spread traces of powder on everything he touches. Jerry Lozeau asserts that it would be easy to find gunshot residue in the suspect's daily environment, especially in his car. Of course, the steering wheel, everything he touches several times or more, the gear lever, the handbrake, the doors, and then his jacket. Yes, he puts his hands in his pockets. He puts them in and picks it up. In the same way, on the evening of the crime, François Darcy was wearing the jacket he regularly wore to go to the shooting range. His defense claims that an analysis could establish the presence of high concentrations of gunshot residue in the pockets of the garment. I can specify that any recreational shooter, when he has fired his bullets, picks them up and puts them back in his pocket in order to then reload them. With some people, if they go sports shooting several times a week, their jacket will be full of it. You can put your hands in it a week, two weeks, you will always get results. And in concentrations, they can be very surprising. Faced with Thierry Lezeux's assertions, the investigating judge orders a second opinion on François Dalcy's clothes and other vehicle. This task is entrusted to the INPS, the National Forensics Institute. The results confirm that François Dalcy's entire environment is indeed contaminated by gunshot residue. The powder found on his hands does not therefore constitute formal proof that he used a firearm on the evening of the incident. This second analysis sows trouble among the investigators. The INPS concluded that the analysis of the powder samples was not admissible. So traces of gunpowder are only interesting if we can prove that Francois Darcy shot himself in the back. How? We've no idea with what weapon. We've no idea. He's not, he may be a recreational shooter, but he's not a contortionist or a gymnast.
In February 2014, two years after the events, the results of the ballistic analysis carried out on the shooting equipment seized from the home of Francois Darcy are finally returned. Investigators first look at the analysis of the 222mm caliber ammunition, and they are struck above all by the method used in the manufacture of these bullets, what the experts call crimping. Crimping is the operation which consists of locking the bullet in the casing. Many projectiles have what's called a crimping neck. The manufacturer makes a groove around the bullet base. In the case of the cartridges that were seized from François Dalcy's home, the crimping hasn't been done in the neck but elsewhere, which is quite surprising and extremely unusual. Ammunition with such an unusual crimp is therefore extremely rare. And yet, the projectile that was removed from François Dalcy's wound is of the exact same type as those fitted to all the 222 cartridges which were found at his home, a projectile which therefore has a completely atypical crimping mark. The coincidence is surprising, especially since the analysis does not stop there. The ballistic experts have also examined the other clues found at the suspect's home. Two ends of rifle barrels were found at François Darcy's, weapons that had been whose barrels had been cut. One of these two barrels comes from a 22 carbine long rifle, and another comes from a 222 carbine. A 222 millimeter caliber rifle, in other words, the same caliber as the bullet that hit François Darcy. But the expert is curious, why did the suspect saw off the barrel of his weapons? In principle, there's no reason to cut off a barrel, except of course to make a weapon and easier to hide. Or maybe if the butt is cut, for example, you'll end up with something that's going to resemble a large revolver in terms of size, which is therefore easier to use in certain conditions. The question then arises, did Francois Dalcy reduce the size of his weapon so that he could shoot himself in the shoulder? But another scenario is possible. What we don't know is if he fired this shot himself, if it was self-inflicted, or if the shot was fired by a third party. On the other hand, the experts are positive about one point. This kind of cut reduces the power of the shot and therefore the injury it causes. Reducing the length of the barrel effectively reduces the speed and therefore the power. If the projectile's initial muzzle energy is 160 kilograms a meter, it will drop to something like 12 to 15 kilograms a meter with a barrel that's been cut off. Another surprising observation, the two pieces of barrel found at his house correspond in every way to the model of the two rifles that he declared stolen three days before the crime. For the investigators, all these elements confirm that François Darcy had planned everything to avoid being fatally injured. The abnormally deformed bullet, the wound itself, while the caliber doesn't allow for this type of injury, suggests that maybe Mr. Darcy worked on the weapons he declared stolen in order to reduce the effect of this ammunition by knowing that he was only going to hurt himself very slightly. But for Francois Darcy's defense team, this scenario does not hold water, especially since the weapon has never been found. If we say he shot himself in the back, we know that he didn't move. So, where is the weapon? Where is the weapon? The canine squads looked for the weapon. I believe that around 70 gendarmes combed the entire area. They didn't find the weapon. You'd have to be crazy to let yourself be shot. And if François Darcy's relatives refuse to imagine that he shot himself in the shoulder, they find it even harder to believe that he could have taken so many risks by asking a third person to shoot him in the back. There's something that's very disturbing. It's very close to the heart. It's very close to the area of the heart. It's the left shoulder. So I can't imagine him ordering someone to shoot him near the heart or shooting himself near the heart, I can't imagine him doing that. 
After two years of investigations, the investigators have collected numerous pieces of evidence to incriminate Francois Dalcy. First, the weapons and ammunition found at his home. Then, the video surveillance footage, which proves that he lied about his movements. And finally, the powder residues found on his hands and on the clothes he was wearing on the evening of the tragedy. However, despite this accumulation of corroborative evidence, gray areas still surround the mysterious Dalcy affair, especially since the only suspect continues to proclaim his innocence. In the puzzle constituted by the crime and the investigation surrounding the crime, we have quite a few pieces, but in the end we don't have the essentials. We've no idea how Sylvie Darcy was killed. And we'll never know, and it's impossible to find out. There is no confession, there's no weapon, there's no evidence. They have nothing. It's just a strong conviction. And so the mysterious murder of Sylvie Darcy has left her relatives, and in particular her two children, aged nine and five, with the never-ending agony of not knowing what happened. Mrs. Darcy's family has been looking for the truth, especially with regard to this woman with two children, who are left behind now, and who have to carry on living with their mother dead and their father in jail.